Today is Mother's Day, and I'm not going to be preaching a Mother's Day message, though I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Instead, I want to talk about something that every great mother has to have, and we all have to have, and that's love. I want to talk about love. A lot of people, when they hear the word love, and they say, maybe, you know, I guess, I don't know, maybe a, maybe, a, maybe a great deal of us feel like we lack love in our lives. Give me one second here. Did I bring down my paper with my scripture up? Tell me, could you do me a favor? Could you run upstairs for me? In the printer, there should be a sheet of paper. Oh, wait a minute. I, that's right, I decided not to print it. Don't worry about it. But today I'm going to talk about love. Love is a broad topic. A lot of people have their perspective on love, but I want to talk about the love that Christ has called his people to walk in. The love of Christ in particular. Let's start in Romans chapter 8. I just want to read a passage of scripture in Romans chapter 8. Let me turn there myself. And starting right at around, let's see, verse 35. Listen, I, listen to that. I have this posted on my Facebook profile at the moment. But these are some powerful things, and I think this is going to bring us right to the heart of what I want to share with you today about the love of Christ, which is also the love of God, because the love of God is in Christ Jesus. It's revealed in him. It says here in verse 35 of Romans chapter 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is powerful. You know, people talk about the love of God and God is love. But this passage of scripture, right there in that last verse, it veers a little bit off the topic at hand. But did you know, for those of you who may not be Christians, that the love of God is in Christ Jesus. All of God's love, the inspired scriptures reveal, are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that is why you cannot have the love of God unless you have Jesus Christ. The scriptures reveal that Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus said, his own words were, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So no one can come to the Father except from him, unless you come through him. No one can have access to the love of God unless you come through Jesus Christ. Because the love of God is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you want the love of God, you must come to Jesus. Now, this is not a, a gospel message necessarily to the lost, but I want you to take note of this thing. I said, and the scripture reveals, that the love of God is in Christ Jesus. Well, how was the love of God revealed in our Lord Jesus Christ? I want to talk about this because many of us want love. Many of us want to be loved. Many of us would like to be able to exhibit sincere love. But before we start talking about having love, being loved, and loving others, I think it's important that we get a clear understanding 
of what love looks like. Now, I know a lot of people have heard the, the, the phraseology agape love. Agape love. What is agape love? Oh, you can say it out loud. God's love. And what, what, what is the description? What is unique about this agape love as we have been, have we learned in, in churches? It is the love that is unconditional, we say. That unconditional love that's not dependent upon what the other does in order for the person who has it to give it. It's not dependent on whether a person likes you or loves you back gives you respect or shows you none at all. Agape love is the love that keeps loving no matter what. And this is what I want to talk about because this agape love that God has for us, we're supposed to have for one another. The same love that Christ demonstrated to us, we're supposed to demonstrate, exhibit, and truly have for one another. I find this passage of scripture that we just read completely amazing because in the Bible's description of love, it's quite different than what is painted in our romance novels, on television, and in our music. Whenever we see love in the context of how the world demonstrates it, it's always connected to fuzzy feelings. It's always connected to perfect moments and circumstances coming together and setting up two people or maybe a group of people to feel warm and fuzzy feelings for one another. I mean, this is what we've grown to understand. We ask a woman, I, do you want to be loved? Yes, I want to be loved. I want somebody to be there to hold me. A man says, yeah, I want to be loved. I need, I need somebody to be there right beside me, right by the guy. To give me that respect that I need and that encouragement that I need. I mean, this love is seen in these things. But I want to show you something about Christian love or the love of Christ more specifically. The love of Christ is not seen in connection to these things. Christ didn't come down and love us because we treated him so well and we wooed him with our great behavior. The love of Christ is not seen in the scriptures as a response from God to our wonderful deeds of love towards him, you know? And I, I bring that to the table is because I believe that we have a double standard when it concerns love. I believe that we expect God to love us through all of our mess and to deal with us and to forgive us. And when it comes to us and loving God and the other people, I think that we're dependent on their treating us a certain way if they're going to have our love. I think that we find it hard, or some of us have even downright decided we're not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to let nobody disrespect me. Only people that are going to get my love are those who deserve it. You know, those who love me, they will get my love. Oh, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Might sound like your favorite psychologist. You know, maybe Dr. Phil. Might sound a little bit like Dr. Phil. Get all those people out of your life that don't love you. But what about those people in your life that serve Christ? What about the people in your life that seem to have all these imperfections that cause you pain and frustration? Should we cast them away? When you know deep down they're trying, but they ain't trying fast enough for your patience. They haven't become perfected fast enough for you to be able to accept them in your life. Because right now they're just a, just a burden. I want to read something to you also, and we're going to revisit Romans chapter 8, but 
with that being said, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to read right down to about, let's see here, verse 12. I just shared this with, with, a, with a, a, a great couple just uh, yesterday, and I think it would be great for you as well in the context of love. I want to show you something about God's requirements for us as his elect, as his people of God, as his children. Listen to this. It says here in verse 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Are you a child of God? Are you a son of God? Well, the scripture says that you want to put some things on as the elect of God, the chosen of the Lord. He says, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. Bowels of mercy. God wants us clothed. As the elect of God, holy and beloved. That means we're set apart now. We're not like the world. We're set apart. We're sanctified unto the Lord for himself and his usage. That's what that word holy means when it concerns us. God has called us out from the world, called us out from that which, has, which is secular or unholy or has nothing to do with God. And he has made us for his usage alone. And we are beloved. We are loved by him. So as the elect of God, as those called out and separated from the world unto the Lord's usage, those of us who are his beloved, he says for us to put on, what was that? Bowels of mercy. And actually, mercies, plural. The first thing he tells us to do is not get our faith up. Not get your knowledge up. As the elect of God, you need to get mercy up. You need to, you need to put on mercy. You need to have a mindset to do what? Not give and treat people the way you think they deserve to be treated or to give them what you think they deserve. See, mercy recognizes that a person deserves this. But they're not going to give them that. They're going to treat them better than what they deserve. This is important, saints. Did not Christ give us mercy? For us who are the saints of God, do we have what we deserve? Are we experiencing what we deserve? In this life, we have received great many mercies for the things that we have done. We know we should be enduring greater hardship in our lives for the things that we have done. And God has shown you mercy. You didn't get what you deserve. And we don't get what we deserve ultimately. It is by the love of God that he provided a means to show us mercy through the son that he sent our Lord Jesus Christ. See, because justice requires that we pay the wages of our sins against God. Yet God so loved us that he sent his only begotten son. I mean, his unique son. He sent him to save us from the penalty of our sins, that which we deserve. The Bible says that the wages of of sin is death. And our blood, our death was what we had to pay according to the justice of God's law, the perfect justice of God's law. But his mercy revealed in Christ afforded us a means to escape what we really deserve. So my question to you, people of God, the elect of God, the chosen of the Lord and the beloved of God, do you give people what they deserve? Do you love those who you only feel deserve your love? 
Are you kindly affectionate towards those who you feel have earned this affection only? If so, this is not the love that God has called you to. This is not agape love demonstrated in our lives when we act like this. We're supposed to be merciful. We're not supposed to give people what they deserve. We're supposed to give them mercy. There are times when my daughter does some things wrong. And I'm sure my son will be growing up pretty soon to get older for me to use him as an example. But he's not there yet. There have been times when my daughter did some things wrong and she already knew. It was already said. The law and the consequence. <laughs> Spanking is the consequence of this action plus some punishment. And there are times when I say, now you know I said that if you do this, you would get that. But today I'm showing you mercy. You're not going to get a spanking today. I'm just going to talk to you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to get it right without consequence. Are you showing mercy in the lives of the people that God has placed among you or around you? Or are you sticking it to them? Have you given people a cold shoulder and just shut them out because of things that they have done wrong to you? If so, you are not exhibiting the love that God has shown to you because he didn't just cut you off and shut you down just because you did wrong towards him. He provided a way for reconciliation through Jesus Christ. Have you provided an open door policy of reconciliation towards the people? Who have sinned against you and caused you harm? The next thing he says here in this passage, he says, kindness, humbleness of mind. Excuse me. He knows a little stuffy because of the power. So with mercy, you have to marry that with kindness. See, that means you can't be disgruntled in your mercy giving. You can't just be like, well, oh, man, oh, I got to do what God said. Do I? Fine. Well, I tell you, you, you know what? I should just tear your mind up, but I'm going to show you some mercy. That's, that's not what God is talking about. That's not what he's talking about. This mercy is giving with kindness. And humbleness of mind. Now this is important. To have a humble mind. Married with mercy. See, because you can't be kind without the humbleness of mind. Let, let me read that again. I, I, I want to I read that. From the beginning. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. Let me finish the verse. Meekness, long-suffering. All of these things right here we're supposed to put on. Now mind you, this is all in connection with the love of Christ. You'll see as we continue in the verses. Mercy is actually not a different subject in the love of Christ. It's a part of the love of Christ. But we have to be humble in our minds. And we have to be kind. And what do I mean by humbleness of mind? You can't think you're all of that. See, I think it's very arrogant when a person finds it hard to forgive someone. That means, in a sense, they view themselves as guiltless. Else they wouldn't be so quick to stick it to other people if they were reminded of how much sin they have in their life. So when we don't give mercy to other people, this is usually founded upon a disproportionate view of yourself. You view yourself more highly than you really are. And as a result, you lack the ability to have true compassion, which would lend mercy out to others. 
when you can identify with somebody's tendency to make a mistake, with somebody's tendency to do what they know is wrong, you've done it yourself. You've done things you knew was wrong. You knew God wasn't pleased with it. Knowing these things beforehand, and you succumbed. You knew you should have. You knew the way out. You knew the way of escape, and you chose to do it anyway. And then afterwards, you felt busted for doing it, in spite of the fact that you saw the way out. And you want to stick it to somebody else because you feel like they knew better. Well, you know better. And yet God showed you mercy. He saw the sorrow in your heart for even pulling a trick like that, thinking you could pull a trick like that on God. And he had mercy upon you and gave you opportunity to not do that again. And you know what? You probably slipped up and you did it again. And he gave you yet another opportunity to get it right and to not do it again. You know what? He suffered long with your disobedience. He dealt with your disobedience, and guess what? He's still dealing and suffering your disobedience. And this is what long suffering is about with mercy and kindness and humbleness of heart and mind. See, the love that the scripture reveals is not married to butterflies and great feelings of, of romance and things like that. It is married to circumstances that require mercy. For this is what the love of Christ is toward us, in that he died on the cross and loved us before we loved him. He wasn't receiving love from us, he was receiving that which was an offense to the Father, sin. He died for our sins. He didn't die on the cross for our righteousness towards him, because we treated him so well, and we were worthy to be a living sacrifice for. It was because of our unworthiness that the love of God was revealed in Christ Jesus. What am I saying to you? What am I telling you? Stop looking for people to prove themselves to receive your love, especially if you're a husband or a wife. Yeah, you might have thought you married somebody and found out he was a completely different person or she was a completely different person. But I'm telling you, they feel the same way about you. And it may not be because you tried to hide. You were sincere. But guess what? When marriage came, your love was tested because now you became acquainted in a more personal way with the weaknesses and sinful parts of your partner or your husband or wife. It was your opportunity now to prove your love, you see. We talk and make it a profession and a commitment of love in the beginning, but when marriage comes or relationships endure trial and frustration and offense, now the time is to prove your love, whether it's agape or not, whether it's unconditional or not. You know the vows for better or for worse. Does your love reveal the worst? Can never separate you from it. That's what Romans 8 was really all about. It was a testament to the purity of the love that the person had, that we have as the body of Christ concerning our Lord. Those of us who are his servants, who truly have his love, our love will endure all things. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. This proves whether the love of Christ is in your life. Let's go back to Romans 8, and I'll show you a little bit more. We'll, we'll go back to Colossians chapter 3 in a moment. But I want to highlight some things that maybe we glanced over, or maybe you didn't tap into when I was reading these verses in the beginning. Give me a second to turn there myself. Romans chapter 8, starting right out 
in verse 35, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And I'm going to ask you this. Who has separated you or what has separated you from the love of Christ as it's supposed to be revealed to God or your brethren or your spouse? Listen to what our profession is according to the scriptures. You know, everybody wants to talk about, you want to confess the promises of God. Okay, the promises are easy to confess. But what about the stuff that God is concerned about concerning you and your character and your love? We need to be making these confessions. Because these are more important than the focus on the promise. Because if all you do is focus on the promises of God, you know what? You're never going to get them. Because God has us to focus not only on the promises of God and pay attention well. I said if all you do is focus on the promises of God, you're not going to get them. You have to focus on them and the other stuff in the scripture that we're supposed to focus on. You can't just have one and not focus on the other. So I want to bring some things. I want to bring some balance to the table because I know the false teachers and prophets on the TV have just bombarded you with the promises of God that they have neglected to show you the things that will ensure you get them. These things right here in verse 35, your endurance and your willingness and your execution of this kind of love. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Listen to this. Right out in the beginning. There's a declaration concerning the love of Christ that it is not dependent on safety. It is not dependent upon whether or not your spouse can keep you safe. Let me tell you something. When God brings danger upon you and it is destined to end in your life being taken, that spouse can't protect you from that. Consider Job. Satan was walking around seeking whom he may devour, the scripture reveals. And God said, Have you considered my servant, Job? So, for all you people who may have believed the lies of the false prophets that have told you that if you serve the Lord, Satan can't touch you, don't you understand? That with Job, it was because he was a true servant of the Lord that God sent him in the first place to prove the sincerity of his love. Because Satan said to God, well, the only reason why he serves you is because look at his life. He's got his family. He's living well on the earth. Oh, come on. Anybody can serve you like that. He's like, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Take his family. Take his life. Well, not his life, but his health. Take his quality of life, that is. And you know, Satan took him down so much that all the supposed righteous people in his life assumed that he had to have done some kind of wrong for these kind of calamities to come in his life. And God brought these calamities to prove that even through these calamities, he will love me to the end. And so Job did. In frustration, feeling the pain, he wasn't a superman. If you read the whole book, Job was a crazy, whiny baby, if you will. I mean, and so would we if we endured such things. I'm not even trying to belittle him. I'm just trying to keep it real. He was not happy. At first, he had made a commitment. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. But as time hit him, and he kept getting wrong, he kept getting calamities brought upon him, he got weak. He wasn't so gung ho about it anymore. Many of you felt like that about your marriages. Many of you felt like that. I'm tired of going through and going through. And I want to tell you this. The scripture says the race is not given to the swift, but to those who endure to the end. Everybody can start out right and start out powerful and fast, but can you endure to the end? Is your stamina up to par with your expectation of eternal life? 
Can you endure to the end? Or will you give up when it go and gets tough? You know what I'm saying? No pain, no gain. Or I'm going to tell you something here. Pain comes in love. Love hurts. It does. But true love can endure it. True love can overcome it. True love will be glorified in the end because it took upon the suffering that requires, that it requires rather. Let's continue. Let's read a little bit more in these verses here. This is very powerful. Listen to verse 36. It says, as, is, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Have you ever thought to consider that for God's sake you might need to be killed? Not just spiritually, but literally. Have you accepted that reality or the possibility of that being your reality? I know. Why all this doom and gloom? I'm just giving you the truth, my brother and my sister. I want those here in our congregation and those here uh, through the internet to know without doubt what love truly is as it concerns the scriptures, as it concerns Christ. I want you to identify with this so that your love can be just as his love is for us towards those in your life. You know, I know you say, well, I love God, but you know, the scripture says, how can you love him who you haven't seen when you don't even love that person right there who you can see every day? How can you love God if you don't love your brother? See, even your testament about the love that you have for God can be contradicted by the love that you show others that look nothing or looks nothing like the love that God has given you. That's why I wanted to ask those questions in the beginning. Are you loving unconditionally, truly, or are you just celebrating the unconditional love of God towards you? See, take note here that this verse of scripture, these verses of scripture are not describing God's love. It says here, let's, let's read, let's read this again. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. I want you to make this confession. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is talking about the love that we have. The love of Christ in us. I talk about the love of God towards us. I talk about the love of Christ in us that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. No tribulation, no danger, no time of hunger. You know, it's been said by many that one of the greatest causes of divorce are financial problems. And I think that is just pathetic, especially if that association is connected to a Christian. I think it's pathetic. For the scripture has revealed here that one of the things that shouldn't separate us from the love of God is famine. That's extreme poverty when a person is in famine. Should famine destroy the love that a man has for his wife or wife has for a husband? And if so, was the love truly unconditional? Or did she look at her husband as a meal ticket? Or did he look at his wife as a meal ticket? But I thought that for the believer, we hear the words of Paul, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He didn't say my husband. He didn't say your husband or your 
wife with her virtuous qualities. God is the supplier of our needs. God is our protection. He is our shield and strength. This should free us up to love all the people God has placed in our lives through every circumstance. Because God has us in his hands. He has us. There is no threat to us. We can pour ourselves out. We can be transparent. We can tell the truth and not hide it for fear that some people may not be able to handle the truth. They might stab you in the back with the truth. Listen to me. You are in the hands of the Lord. He is your strength. He is your shield. He is your protector. He is your guide. He is your comforter. You have all things in Christ Jesus. You are free to love your brother. You are free to love your sister as the Bible says you ought to. Let us turn to another passage of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the love chapter. In the King James Version, the term is charity. Other translations, go ahead and make the translation to the word love. It's the same thing. I want you to see yet again what the scripture associates with love. Take notice that it doesn't associate any of the fuzzy warm feelings that the world is teaching you to associate with love. And I'm going to share something with you. Don't you know and understand that the world is the devil's domain? The Bible re refers to him as the God of this world. And he also works in the children of disobedience. So if the people of the world are Satan and he, or, 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 or allowing Satan to work in them because they're the children of disobedience. They don't live obeying God's word. So they live doing their own thing. Satan works in them. They control the media. They control the music. They control the educational system. Do you really think they're going to give you definitions of terms that will help you live out the love of Christ? Do you think they're going to show you examples of what love is supposed to look like on TV? Or do you think they'll show you things that will train you to associate stuff with love that has nothing to do with God? So when you finally do give your life to Christ, you find it hard to love because you think love is supposed to be this when it was never supposed to be that. You're expecting love to fulfill things that Satan told you that was connected to it and God said the opposite is connected to that. That's why you had the people when the TV first came out calling the, the television a tool of Satan. People thought they were being extreme. Oh, that, why is everything the devil? Well, if you understand the scriptures, you know that we shouldn't love nothing in the world. All of it is of the devil. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that's in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. All of it. All of it. You need to understand this. There's no grades. There's black and white. There's right and wrong. Heaven and hell. There's no purgatory. There's no middle ground. It's either holy or it's unholy. It's either sanctified or it's not sanctified. It's either right or it's wrong. It's either righteousness or it's sin. You need to understand these things. What are you watching? What do you enjoy as entertainment? What do you take it in unknowingly? This is a hard stuff. I know it is. Now, I'm not trying to be this lawgiver type guy, you know, and try to tell you this is a sin and that's a sin. That's not the point. What I'm telling you is that the information that you are given, it either comes from God or it comes from the world. You need to recognize these things. Let me show you some things about love that your favorite soap opera will tell you. First Corinthians chapter 13. Let me turn there myself. Put a lot of talk in there. It says here, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love, I am become a sounding brass 
or a tickling symbol. That means I'm not communicating anything that can help anybody. I'm useless. Everybody's so set on receiving the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And, uh, listen to me here. <laughs> okay, you speak speaking in tongues. You got all the fancy language. The power of God is working in you to speak in tongues. Okay, great. But if you don't have this love that we're about to get into, guess what? That doesn't mean a dog or a thing. It profits you nothing, the scripture says. You're focusing on the wrong thing. Why is all these denominations or many of these denominations so gung-ho about people speaking in tongues or getting filled with the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? This does not get you heaven. It is not a proof of heaven. It is not a proof of anything. You, did you not forget that people will do great things in Jesus' name? In the end, he'll say, depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. So you really want to really judge whether people are the true servants of God based upon whether they demonstrate the gifts of the Spirit? When the Bible has revealed that one can demonstrate the gift of the Spirit and still go to hell and still have Jesus say, I never knew you? Maybe we should be focusing on that which the Bible proclaims as the greatest and most important thing. Let's continue reading here. He says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So then you got all these pastors who are specializing in faith, teaching you to hold on to the confessions and promises of God and to have faith that can move mountains. But they forgot to teach you about this love we've been talking about. You got all this faith, and this faith has brought you your house, your car. And you don't even know how to treat your wife or your children or your brother in Christ or even your, even your boss. You don't endure suffering long. You, you don't do that. In fact, you, don't, you never want to do that. You're the kind of people that Jesus would actually say in the end, if you don't repent from these things and walk in his love, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. That word iniquity means lawlessness. Love, the Bible says, is the fulfillment of the law. You cannot fulfill the righteousness of the law unless you're walking in this love that we're about to get into, that we're, that we're talking about here. You have your priorities mixed up. You're focusing on the wrong things. You, you're eating all the icing and you have no cake. Let's continue reading here. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. You don't know how many people have said, hey, you can care. tell me I don't have the love of God. I give to the poor. I do these deeds. I sacrifice this for the Lord. Yeah, you may have done all of that. But the Bible says you can do all of that. That doesn't mean you have love. Because love gets into the stuff that we talked about earlier. You know, mercy with other people. Huh? Forgiving and humbleness of mind concerning the people around you with that kind of stuff right there. And you just wait. We, this passage is the love chapter. So this is just an introduction. You know, these verses here at the beginning of this chapter, they're showing you something. The first thing they want to do is to disassociate value from things that you think are important. That's what he's trying to do. Say, okay, you speak in tongues. Okay, if you don't have love, that doesn't mean nothing. It doesn't prompt you anything. So put yourself, I know you thought you were tight because you were speaking in tongues. You, you, you're excited about the wrong things. It's profitless. Without this right here. So put that aside. Okay, so you gave plenty of money. You allowed people to live in your home. You sacrificed this and that for other people. Put it, put, put it aside. Because the scripture is revealing. That's not love either. You can do that and it still profits you nothing if you don't have love. But I thought that was love. Well, evidently it's not love if you can do that and it don't profit you nothing because you don't have love with it. So the scripture is revealing something. That which you thought was a demonstration of your love is a demonstration of something, but it ain't love. Because it's possible for you to do it and not have love with it. 
God means you need to find out well, what? Wait, wait. If this ain't love here, if what I've been doing, which I thought was love, ain't love, then show me what is love, God, because I want to get it right. I want to have that which is profitable for me. Let's read a little bit more. It starts describing love. Listen to this. Charity suffers long. <laughs> Oh, we're back to that again. Wait, why does Christ keep associating love with suffering? That ain't right. I don't, that don't seem right, man. You just seem so doom and gloom. Why is everything all about suffering with you? Because that's what it was about Christ. I'm sorry. If you want the God of Scripture, if you want the Jesus of Scripture, then you better get off the Bible that the TV series put on. I'm not going to get into all of that. But the love that Christ came to show and he wanted us to have was to be able to suffer long. First thing that, that charity is, it suffers long. Get that in your mind. If I want to have the love of Christ, then I must suffer long. Suffer. Say that word. Suffer. Identify with it. Suffering. I know it's the opposite of what a lot of you false pastors and preachers are telling you. You're not supposed to suffer in the Lord. You are more than a conqueror. But if you understood what more than a conqueror meant in Romans chapter 8, which we just read, what it meant was that your love conquers persecution. And that you keep on loving no matter what comes. Therefore, your love overcomes. It doesn't get thwarted. It doesn't become dead through suffering. This is what was so powerful about the church in the first century. No matter how bad they suffered, they would not deny Christ. No matter what persecution and torture they went through, they died professing Christ. They were more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. This is what the Bible is talking about when it's speaking of being more than a conqueror. It's being consistent. It's being Pure and true to the message of love, living it out in your life, no matter what opposes it, you still maintain that love. You suffer long. You don't give up when the going gets tough. No matter how long it takes, you will love. This is the love of Christ. He says, love suffers long in verse 4. And is kind. You remember that when we talked about mercy, and it connected, connected that that mercy and kindness. It's the same thing. You can't be complaining about the suffering that you choose to endure. See, people doing you wrong, and while they're doing you wrong, and you're enduring the suffering that comes along with it, you're still kind. You're still smiling. You're still doing kindness to them, even though you're receiving suffering from them. Your love is not dependent upon the comforts they give you. The kindness that you give is not dependent upon the comforts they give you. In fact, according to the scriptures, your kindness comes with the suffering that you endure long. So kindness in, in, in the scripture is, is, if anything, a response to the adversity that we give. As opposed to what the world says, we give love to those who love us. That's the world. But Christ didn't do that. He loved us while we were yet sinners. Did you get that? He gave us his best while we were giving him our worst. And if you want to proclaim that you have the love of Christ in you, you will do the same. You will give people your best even while they give you their worst. That's why Jesus said, store your treasures in heaven and God will be earth. That's why we, our eternal hope is that of eternal life. It's not based upon what we can get here on the earth because the reality is for a great many people in the body of Christ, they will never be thanked by the people that they love but they will get their reward in heaven. God will say to them, well done, my good and faithful servant of the Lord. 
Let's come on. Let's go back to the scriptures. Let's read a little bit more about this. It's kind of, listen, it's charity envieth not. <laughs> oh, it doesn't get mad because other people got when it doesn't. Or other people in a place or position that it wants to be in and it's angry at them and in these people. Love doesn't do that. In fact, if we read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, love is content with what it, what it has. It's, it's cool. It, if all we got is just some food and clothing, we're content. We're trying to exalt ourselves. And the next part says, it says here, listen to this. Uh, love, vaunted not itself, is not puffed up. So we're not, we're, we're not trying to, you know, Put ourselves on a pedestal. That's, love doesn't do that. Love doesn't. Love is not an opportunist. <laughs> love does not seek opportunity to exalt itself. That's not even in the mindset of those who exhibit the love of God. We're not trying to use you to our own advantage. We don't use others to that. To, see, ah, ah, we do things from the heart. We do, if we're going to do a good deed, it's because we really want to just do a good deed and we want to just love you. We want to supply that deed. We're not hoping that, you know, I hope you saw what I did and hook me up, you know, and, you know, give me an opportunity to do something. We, that's not us. That's not what love is. That's not what the love of Christ does. And surely, we don't think very highly of ourselves. We think very highly of God working in us. We don't think very highly of ourselves. Wait a minute now. Hold on now. now you, you're telling me I can't have good self-esteem? You don't need to have no self-esteem. If you know what the Bible says about you. You were born a shape of iniquity. That was you. That's what the Bible, that's how the Bible describes it. We were born and shaped in iniquity. That's nothing to be proud of. We were born in the image of Adam, in the flesh. Adam was a sinner. He disobeyed God and fell from grace. That's nothing to be proud of. Let me tell you who we boast in, the Lord. We, our boast is in the Lord working in us. Our boast is in, the, in God's spirit living on the inside of us. Our boast is not in our goodness and our abilities. It is, it is in God's ability to be strong in our weakness. Our boast is in the Lord. We don't trust ourselves. We don't trust our hearts. The Bible script defines us, our hearts as wicked and evil from the very beginning. Don't follow your heart. You need to follow the spirit. Love knows this. Love has a low view of self and it views others generally higher than themselves. Generally, I think I might have made, I might have made that a little too, too nice for you. And it views everybody higher than themselves. That's what love does. Love considers others before self. And instead of loving self first, the Bible says we love our neighbors as ourselves. It didn't say we love ourselves first and then we love our neighbors. We love our neighbors as if they were ourselves. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that greater love is no man than this, that he would lay his life down for his friends. So love will cause itself harm to give life to others. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Love is more concerned about fulfilling the needs of others than fulfilling its own needs or others fulfilling its needs. Too many people who profess Christ are self-absorbed. They want everybody to serve them and fulfill their needs. God is going to take care of your needs. What? Why are you worried about that? The Lord loves you. He's going to take care of your needs. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He was talking about the needs of life. He said, don't, don't even think about that. That's what the heathens are worried about. That's what the worldly people worry about. Taking care of themselves. Well, for us, God takes care of us. 
So we're free to do his will and focus on that. We're free to focus on those things pertaining to the kingdom of God and not pertaining to the cares of this world. We're free to live righteously. Just as the scripture reveals. To love and endure for others because we know in the end God has got us. He will take care of us. He will protect us. Let's continue reading a little bit more here. We're almost done. He says here, verse 6, love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. How many of us have fallen into the shameful position of being happy with Bad things happen to people. Or looking for something bad that happened to somebody. A gloating over a monstrosity like murder. You know, it's you know, let me let me make this a little bit more practical here. Because it's not really like that. It's not sold to us like that. You know, I just watched the movie Django. And you know what happens when you watch that movie unconsciously? You, you're rejoicing every time he kills one of those people. You know, the, the lead character. The, I can't remember. The, the, oh, Django, yeah. Every time Django kills one of those slave masters, we're rejoicing in iniquity. It's revenge, you see. We identify with what they did with him, and he murders them. He gets them back, and you're like, yeah! That's the, that's the rejoicing in the iniquity. You see, we are rejoicing in what the world calls justified evil. Yeah. For the whole team. Many of us rejoice in being Americans and our world dominance. We rejoice in that. Not understanding that our world dominance is based upon iniquity that our country has done. It's just the truth. Do any real research outside of what you hear on television, you'll understand that we, as a nation, to get the power and control that we have in the world today, that in the very beginning we weren't even seeking. We just wanted to be a sovereign nation. Now we want to be an empire that owns everything. Well, in order to be an empire, you have to do iniquity. Sinful things in order to have this kind of power control over those in the world. And we rejoice in that. This is what I'm talking about here. We rejoice in fornication when we watch a lot of these love stories on TV or listen to this music. That we say, that's my favorite song. You know the song we got nothing about. Carnal lust. And you're rejoicing in it. This is what I'm talking about here. This is why the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Because the world is designed to make you rejoice in iniquity. To make you love sin. That's what it's all about. And I'm just been touching on just a few things. There's so many other things. But these are just a few examples of how you become one who rejoices in iniquity. But if you were consumed with the kingdom of Christ as revealed in the scriptures and how we are to love one another as the church, because that is really the kingdom of God, the church of Christ. And the laws given to us in that kingdom, and it's really all about loving God and loving one another, then you would not be deceived to emulate and to take upon the mindset of the world that we live in. You would understand that though we are in the world, we're not of it. We're not citizens of the world's kingdoms. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. We're ambassadors even more so of the kingdom of God. Ambassadors really of Christ himself as the scripture reveals. Verse 7 says that love bears all things, believes all things. Hopes all things, endures all things. Oh man, time is is, is is upon me. Let me just continue reading it to the end. Charity or love never fails. 
fails. Listen to that. It never fails. Love will never fail you. Enduring for Christ's name's sake will never fail you. But whether there be prophecies, you know, people want to be super prophet. The Bible says, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, listen to this, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. So all these words and knowledge of people, the gifts of the Spirit, they're not given to you in complete perfectness or perfection. They're only given to you in part. But listen to this. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The only reason why we speak in tongues, let me, let me just help you out in the scripture. The only reason for speaking in tongues and, and prophecy and words of knowledge, those things are tools, gifts of the spirit used to edify the body in love. They're tools to get you to be perfect in love. Once you have perfect love, there's no need for those things anymore. That's what the scripture is telling you. Love is the principal thing. For you to be able to love your brother as Christ loved you, if you can do that, then there's no need for you to operate or receive from others that have the gift of, of speaking in tongues. Because they would only speak to you in tongues and an interpreter interpret that tongue if they need to give you a word that reveals your lack of love and gives you the solution in perfecting it. That's what the body is, or the word of God is revealing here. Once you have perfect love, there's no need for these things. Let's continue reading. Verse 11 says, listen to this. Now, this is important. Because now you're about to see something concerning yourself or maybe others. It says here, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. What am I telling you? I know we hear this verse, but let's just put it in this context. It's talking about focusing on those things that have nothing to do with love. It's the childish Christian that gets all excited about speaking in tongues. It's the immature Christian that gets all excited about being a prophet or hearing a word of prophecy. It says, look, when I was a child, I put away childish things. Remember, with that which is perfect, this you ain't going to need those things. So he's trying to bring another way of, 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 of uh, exemplifying the point here. He's bringing another example here. So look at it this way. When I was a child, I thought as a child. I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought, uh, excuse me, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know, even as also I am known. What is connected to knowing in part? The gifts of the Spirit here. Words of knowledge. Tongues ceasing. Prophecies failing or ceasing or stopping. Listen to this. Verse 13 is the key here. And now abideth or liveth. These are things that matter right here. Right here. These are the things that live. Abideth means they live continually. It's perfect present tense. They will continue to be. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. Love. I'm not telling you don't have faith. And I remember, I didn't tell you to throw away the promises of God. Those are the hopes. As long as those promises are actually the promises of God and not what other people are telling you are the promises of God. That's a whole other subject. But the hope and faith and, and love, all of these things, we, these are the things that make up the believer, the core, the foundation of the believer. But let's not get this twisted here. The greatest of these things, the most important of these things. If there's going to be something that you focus on the most, the most, forget being the, being so proud that you have to have so much faith. Uh, don't even be so proud of your hope. You need to focus on the execution and the living out of love, and then marry that to faith and hope. 
See, because if you have faith and you have hope, without love, you will not get the hope. It's the love of God in us that is the thing that is connected to every person that actually receives the hope. Because love causes you to endure to the end and not give up the hope and not give up the faith. Even things don't look or make any sense. It's your love of God that keeps you going on even though you can't make sense of this thing. Even though everything around you seems like it goes against the faith. The fact that you would never turn your back on God and that you know God told you to do what he said do. Even though your faith right now is weak, the love of God keeps you going because you love him too much to walk out on him. That is what keeps you in the faith. And it keeps you holding on to the hope because of your love of the one that your faith is in. Because of the love of the one who has given you the hope. Talk about the love of Jesus Christ. Not the love that the world has sold you, advertised to you, and indoctrinated you with from your birth. I'm talking about the love of Christ that was given to you at new birth. When you were born again of the Spirit. The love that drew you to Christ. This is the love that every believer should be endeavoring to make the most important thing and go over their life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for you have demonstrated and given us that same love that you would require of us, oh God. You are no hypocrite. You are no crazy God, but you are a loving, merciful God. You are holy and you're just and you will mete out justice, but you will also reveal your mercy and grace toward us. So we thank you for the grace of God that allows us to grow, that allows you to suffer along with us as we attempt to, to do your will, O oh Lord, as we do your will, O oh Lord. And as we fail in doing your will, many times over, you choose not to give us what we deserve. You consider our sincerity of love towards you and you forgive us, oh God. You keep us in your hands and hold us in your hands. I'm asking you, Lord, I know you've called us to separate from people. I'm not saying we shouldn't separate from people, Lord, but there are we want to do it on the conditions of your word and not on uh, the conditions of imperfect love, oh Lord. You've never called us to separate from people because they wasn't loving us right. That's not your word. I know that's what a lot of Pastors and preachers have told us, oh Lord, but I'm asking you to liberate your people from the false messages that have been preached to us as, as, as if they were your words, oh God. Much of the world has infiltrated the church. Many people have believed doctrines of devils as your word concerning love. And I'm asking you, Lord, at the sound of my voice, as people hear this message on the internet, as we hear it right now, that you allow your word of God in us, through the Spirit, or by the Spirit, to discern between truth and error. Allow us to do that, Lord God. Allow us to see love in our lives according to your word, Lord. Allow us to see the areas in which we lack in, Lord, and allow us the grace, Father. Give us the grace to walk in those areas, Lord, to be perfect in our love towards you and others. May your name will be glorified that people would see and know Jesus in the church, oh God, because we'll be loving one another as you have ordained us to do, oh God. We thank you so much for your grace and mercy upon us. Give us the opportunity to give the same mercy and grace and love towards all the people around us. Jesus' name. Amen.